Okay. Chapter 17, a moment of rage. Anger was Moses' Achilles heel, just like it's mine along with impatience. But we're here to talk about Moses, not to talk about me. We're down to chapter 17, and we got three chapters to go. Dangerous moments. This is talking about today. You, we can read, we can see road rage on the highways all the way to going postal is a phrase that we use. And there's a graph of serial killings since the 80s. And look at the trend. We are living in dangerous times. We are living in times that try men's souls. So we're talking about the story of an angry man. The first time anger is connected with Moses was at the age of 40. A murderous anger. You say, well, I get angry, but I've never killed anybody. Jesus said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, he that is angry against his brother already has committed murder. Murderous anger. One day when Moses had grown up, 40 years old, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew at one of his people. And he looked this way and that. You know, the old saying is count count to 10 when you're angry. He didn't count to 10. In fact, he looked this way and that way. He was, he was, pardon the pun, dead set on doing this thing. So then we move to an unnecessary anger. This is the scenario where Moses goes into Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And if you don't, your firstborn, the firstborn of all your people, the firstborn of all your livestock, they're all going to die. Well, Pharaoh didn't say, go ahead, take them. And so we see here, and he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. We're going to see that same phrase, hot anger, in a little bit. But he was hot. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. That didn't change Moses' mindset. He was still angry unnecessarily. Then we have destructive anger. Now, my boys wrestled, and every once in a while, we would go to a wrestling meet, and we'd see somebody lose a match. They'd run into the locker room, and the next year, here's bang. Somebody punches out a locker. I said to my boys, you ever do that, and you'll be done. That's a destructive anger. And this is Moses. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, tablets that were written on both sides, tablets front and back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. They were engraved by the finger of God. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, there's a hint of why Joshua was selected over Caleb, but we'll get to that. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Now, keep in mind, Moses had all of his faculties. At age 120, the Bible says that he still had his strength and his, uh, his strength had not abated. He still had his eyesight and his ears were very keen as well because Joshua said, hey, I hear them. Moses said, yeah, I hear them too, but it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. There's a party going. And as soon as, age 40, he looked this way and that way. It was calculated. Age 81, 80, 80-ish. As soon as, you know, we use the, the phrase fly off the handle. Well, Moses flew off the handle, just like one of those boys going and punching out a locker room. They had enough time to think about going from the mat to the locker room, but they didn't get, engage the brain. As soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. There's that hot anger again. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. You say, well, if Moses was an excuse maker, he said, well, I lost my head. I flew off the, I flew off the handle. But we're going to continue. That verse 19, we just talked about as soon as. But I want you to look at verse 20. He didn't just throw the tablets down when he noticed what the party was going on. He went down into the party. He had plenty of time for his anger to abate. 
but it didn't happen. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. There was a long time when his anger was just boiling and boiling. I would say that he just went from anger to, to rage. So what did God say? Okay, Moses, you broke the set I made. This next set, you do it yourself. So we've talked about murderous, unnecessary, and destructive anger. Now we're going to talk about rebellious anger. When I was a kid, I was a rebel. And my dad, it, it's no wonder I could see a heavenly father's love because my dad loved me. He was long suffering. Moses strikes the rock. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month and the people stayed at Kadesh. That word Kadesh means holiness. They were in the wilderness, but they were in holy ground. We're going to see a play on that word in a little bit. Now, there was no water for the congregation. Water is always a picture in God's word of the word. The word of God was not permeating in their hearts. And so what happens? Something else has to replace that. Now, there was no water for the congregation, and the people assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Keep in mind, this is the end of the 40-year trick. They just saw 600,000 of their buddies, their husbands, their dads, their colleagues die. And they say, would that it was me instead of them because there's no water. There's a death wish for you. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? You could be in a holy place. I'd like to think this piece of real estate has been sanctified, meaning set apart for the Lord. You could be in this holy place, but your mind could go to the depths. Don't let yours go that way right now because I said that. Your mind could be the chickens in the oven. Your mind could be, oh, the Eagles are not playing today. It's a Monday night football. And those are not evil in and of themselves. But you could be surrounded by God's people. You could be in a moment of worship. You could be in a great moment where the pastor is teaching. And you could be in an evil place. It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. That's exactly right. That's why God wanted to take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And there is no water to drink. So this one has pushed Moses over the edge. He just saw 600,000 of his colleagues die. His sister, his big sister, just died. At one point, he was suicidal. He was so discouraged, so depressed. The complaining and the grumbling never cease, and he's got nowhere to hide. He spends 40 years in the desert with sheep, sheep, and now he has spent 40 more years in the desert with people, sheep. And he has had a lifelong struggle with anger. So the people come to him and they say, why did you bring us to this evil place? We don't have any figs or pomegranates and no water and our animals are going to die and we're going to die. I wish we died with those guys. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them and the Lord spoke to Moses. Now, we just read about a scenario where the glory of the Lord came out of the tabernacle and dwelled there. Here's the glory of the Lord again coming. And they didn't do this in a vacuum. They did it in front of all the assembly. And that's one of the reasons that Moses and Aaron couldn't go to the promised land. It was a public offense. Just like Miriam, she spoke in front of the entire assembly. It was a public offense. Offense. So she was struck with the leprosy and she was put outside the camp. The camp didn't move. Why? Because of Miriam. It was a public offense. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the staff 
and assemble a congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. So Moses took the staff from the Lord as he commanded him, but he didn't do what the Lord told him to do. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? There's a tone of blasphemy in here. He wasn't going to be providing any water. In fact, Moses didn't provide anything to the people. It was all God. Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? Now, the glory of the Lord was there. He gets in front of the people and he starts his speech. God couldn't ignore that. God is not only a merciful God, he is also a just God. And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff, not once, but twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah. These are the waters of quarreling. These are the waters of dispute where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord. And through them, he showed him holy. So first of all, it wasn't just Moses that forfeited the opportunity to go into the promised land. It was Aaron as well. But second of all, there were two reasons that Moses and Aaron couldn't go. Number one, they didn't believe God when God said, just talk to the rock. And number two, it was a public offense. How is God going to deal with those things? <laughs> know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be slow to hear, quick to speak, quick to anger. Does the Bible say that? No, it's the exact opposite. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear. The Lord spoke to Moses and he heard what he had to say. Slow to speak. He picked up that rod and he went out there and he started his speech. And slow to anger. Well, Moses went 0 for 3. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Moses did not uphold him as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. The anger of, the, of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, <clears throat> put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Those verses we just read, those are James 19, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. And verse 21 talks about that meekness. And yet Moses was the meekest man. Moses had a close walk with God. The Lord said to Miriam, I speak to the other prophets with dreams and visions, but I, I talk with Moses face to face. Moses was close to the Lord, and yet Moses could fail. I don't know how close anyone in this room is to the Lord. But mark it down, any one of us can fail. So some lessons learned. Number one, the act of disobedience stems from unbelief. Moses didn't believe what he was going to do, so he went out and he decided to blaspheme. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Who were disobedient? Well, sir, first of all, who were the people that died in the wilderness? You had Moses die. You had Aaron die, you had Miriam die, and you had the 600,000 die. So they're asking the question, who died? Is those because of their unbelief? Now, when we say because there was unbelief, does that tell me that Moses was a lost man? No. You read Hebrews chapter 11, and he gets several verses in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. In this instant, he didn't believe. Number two. A public act of disobedience diminishes God's glory. There was Miriam, back talked her brother. There was Moses, didn't listen when God told him to speak to the rock. And God's glory got compromised. And we see that in churches today. 
If I pointed to any one of you, you could say, yes, I've heard of a situation where pastor stole the treasury or pastor ran off with the organ player or whatever it was. And in every case, God's name gets dragged through the, through the mud. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. You might not be a Bible teacher like standing in front of the group and talking, but every one of us is teaching something. Whether it's the way we act or where we go or whatever we do, and we are going to be judged more strictly than, say, the baby Christian who doesn't know the difference between an apostle and an epistle. We will be judged more strictly. And number three, any such act, though forgiven, bears painful consequences. If I said, name a radio preacher, name a TV preacher that fell, most hands, maybe all hands would go up. We're not going to name names, all right? But I'll name a name from Bible. David was guilty of both adultery and murder. He was forgiven. Yet what happened to his life based upon these altercations he became a man of blood he lost four of his kids he lost his kingdom for a while he didn't have the same uh when we studied david remember everything he touched he he became prosperous he became successful prosperous not just in terms of wealth but everything he did was for his good that sin hit and things went downhill so what does Swindoll have to say? And we're going to end on this. I don't want one moment of anger or pride or arrogance to cast a shadow over a lifetime of walking with my Lord. You can tell that I have a lot of respect for Chuck Swindoll for the materials that I use, the number of times that I quote him. Imagine if he fell, what that would do to me. Imagine if he fell, what that would do to Christianity at large, people that listen to him on the radio or read his books. He said, I don't want one moment to ruin that, not for his pride, but for the sake of God's name. Frankly, I fear that possibility. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And you know what? I want to fear that possibility. When I stop fearing it, I'm in grave danger. And so you see, I'll end on this one. Danger is one letter away from anger.